As always, on a Wednesday, joined by our good friend Frankie Corrado from TSN. Only this time we, we have Jeff Patterson helping to join into the fray, even though Matt is back on the show today as well. Frank, how are you, sir? Good. How you guys doing? Very yeah, well. well. We're past Labor Day, so we're very excited. We see signs of, of hockey ahead. Um, maybe that's changed for you now that you're in the media. But what does is, what is Labor Day, the passing of Labor Day, mean for you as far as the hockey season? As a player, Labor Day was always like the target day for when I want to be ready to essentially start training camp, right? Like, I think if you're waiting to to get yourself ready later into the month, it's like you're almost cutting it close. So, you know, for Labor Day, it means a lot of guys are reporting to their teams or, or traveling out. And it's like you get to the point in the summer where the workouts have really gotten shorter and you're not lifting as much and you're really focused on – um, kind of maintaining what you've done throughout the summer. And it's more speed-based, I guess, if you want to um, describe it any type of way. And then, you know, on the ice now, it's like you're pretty much ready to go. Like you got two weeks here before camp is, is really going to get going and, and the pace is going to pick up. But um, now's the time. I think I think on the media side of things, it's a little different because, you know, we just there's so many variables, broadcast schedules, who's taking what game, uh, who's working – where so i think like as a player you can control kind of how your body was and and where you were at with your conditioning and your on ice preparation all that kind of stuff i think as as a broadcaster in the media you almost look at it you're like i got a few more weeks here before it is full steam ahead and you know we go right through to the playoffs there's there's a lot of nights so it's two different ways of looking at it but you know i just it was always like my target date Labor Day comes around, summer is officially over. There's like maybe one round of golf a week happening if you're lucky. It's like we're on the ice five days a week and, and we're ready to roll getting into training camp. The Canucks had two options last January. They could have just continued their course and been players in the Connor Bedard lottery, but this management group elected to make a coaching change. Uh, and the thinking was Rick Tockett could get 36 games as he did and instill values and systems and everything else. How much is that going to help when they hit the ground at training camp in Victoria? So I, I think Blake and I were talking about this last year. And there's there's two things that you got to keep in mind. Like, if, if you want to talk about the team playing well and momentum, like, that doesn't really play into it, you know, come, going into this season. But I will say that if, if Tockett went in there and he laid his foundation as far as what he wants away from the puck, uh, the philosophies he wants to establish with the puck, those kinds of things at this time of year are going to be easier for guys to wrap their head around because, like you said, they got the 36 games and there's just a little more familiarity with it, even how he wants to communicate things. I think sometimes for players, you know, that's something that takes a little adjusting, right? There's some coaches, they're going to be super blunt and upfront with you. And there's some coaches, they just, quite frankly, don't talk to you unless they absolutely have to. Um, Talkit is one of those guys that takes a lot of initiative to go out and talk to his players and reach out and see, um, you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. So I, I think players will appreciate that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, looking back at last year, if the foundations were laid, it's going to be easier for guys to, to kind of pick up on things going into training camp. But let's not kid ourselves. Like it's a brand new season. And, you know, when you get off to whatever kind of start you get off to, that's going to set the tone for your season. So if you want to play, be playing in garbage time by February, chances are you had a really bad start. And whatever you did the year before didn't really carry over into this season. So um, it's like the games really matter right at the start of the season. And it'll be up to the team to kind of get up to speed and say, we're not playing garbage time hockey anymore. We're not trying to finish in 10th place. Like we want to be playing meaningful games down the stretch here, you know, either two points in or two points out of a playoff spot on any given day. Travis Green's training camps kind of took on a life of their own with the bag skate. And we all have seen the, remember the picture of Olia Levy, basically, you know, sealing his fate as a member of the Canucks lying prone in the corner uh, out in Abbotsford a couple of years ago. From a player's perspective though, Frank, like, how much anticipation is there, I suppose, for new guys to the Canuck organization, or you were a new player in different cities as well, You know, getting the feel for a head coach and how he conducts a training camp? I, I think first impressions are so important as a player. 
And it's just, there's just something about getting off on the right foot and you just don't want to be chasing it, you know, climbing uphill, um, you know, trying to get on the right side of things. And, you know, you, you just don't want to be wasting games. So training camp, obviously for new players is a great way to make a good first impression, but there's like this balance you want to walk as well, right? Where you make a good first impression, you're going hard at training camp. You also got to remember that you're going to be playing with these guys all season long, right? So, you know, people tend to make fun of guys that are a little too heroic at training camp, you know, the heroes. It's like, you need to find that balance, but no one can really blame you if, if you don't really have a spot on the team and you need to use that training camp to, to make yourself assert yourself on the team. Um, you know, it comes to, to Greener's training camp, and, and this goes for a lot of coaches. You just know going into that camp, there's one or two things that they're going to do that is going to suck, but you really have to get through it. And I think, you know, when, when you talk about a bag skate or, or fitness testing or skating testing, all these kinds of things, we think about, you know, the time or the amount of repetitions and, you know, essentially the results. I think a lot of the times the coaches are just looking at how do you handle this thing that sucks that you don't want to do that you think is stupid, that probably is stupid and has no bearing on the game. But how do you handle that? Because throughout the course of an 82-game season, there's going to be things that are thrown your way, whether it's the coach that throws it your way or the game itself or the team you're playing. It's like coaches want to know how you're going to handle those situations. So as much as players, we care about these results and the fitness testing and the skate testing and all that kind of stuff, and you want to do well, um, really what coaches want to see is, you know, what's your character? What's your made out, what you're made out of? How do you kind of handle these, these little adversities? Um, so I just, you know, I, I don't like when the fitness testing stuff, players start training for the fitness test instead of training for hockey. It's different to train for an 82 game season than it is to train to do 15 reps of 200 pounds on the bench press or, you know, be able to, to do some kind of squat test or deadlift, max deadlift. These things have kind of been phased out now. But I think it's important for the coaches or the, the strength and conditioning staff to realize that if they're going to impose these kind of crazy tests, the players are going to train specifically for it. So that might take them away from their training to be, you know, pliable and flexible and essentially very good hockey players. So there's a balance to be had there uh, that the coaching and, and training staff need to find. Do you train for a coach, though? Uh, I mean, like, a, a guy knows his own deficiencies. If he wants to improve his shot, he's going to work on his shot. If it, your defense mate didn't like the way you are making your turn last year, your pivot, I mean, you could work on those sorts of things. But do you think any players on the Canucks are thinking, I think Rick will want to see this out of me, so I'm going to do this, so I'm going to work on this? Do you think, do you think it gets that specific? A hundred percent. I know I did that when I, when I played in Toronto. So after I, I left my, my first season in Toronto, I think I was finishing that year at around 194 pounds, 195 pounds. And you're pretty observant. Like you look around and you say, okay, I see one guy, he's 210, one guy, he's 215, another guy that's 205. And I'm like, those guys play every single night. And I know how much the coach, you know, really valued that bigger kind of player especially on the back end so I went out that summer and my my biggest focus was to obviously get stronger get faster but get bigger and get heavier and I went back into the next training camp just under 210 pounds which I had never ever been wow. at yeah I, I I put on 10 pounds at the age of 22 and I obviously like my frame I could never keep that kind of weight on but that was my mindset. It was like I was going into training camp at just under 210 pounds. And I knew that that was going to be on paper. And I felt good about that. And I'd always be listed that year as six foot one, you know, 208 pounds. Right. And, and it's just like those are the, the dumb things that you think about as a player. But of course, you, you try to appease the coach because ultimately, um, you know, that's that's the guy that that gives you an opportunity on the ice and that leads to you know you uh doing well and, and making more money like let's be honest that's what it's all about right obviously winning's in there as well but you know it's a livelihood thing you want to take care of your own backyard uh, as far as talk it goes like you know everyone's kind of doing similar stuff everyone wants their shot to get better right like how many times do we see players come back the next year, Connor McDavid, I think, is one of the best examples. Last year, everyone kept saying, well, a shooting percentage is bound to come down at some point. It never did. 
Like the guy just worked on his shot. He worked on his release. He could release it from so many different areas on the ice. The guy scored 64 goals. So like there's going to be players that come into this season and you're like, wow, I didn't see that coming. Well, maybe they, they recognize something that they needed to work on. But absolutely, players are going to do something to appease the head coach. Frank, wait, I, I too, have, by the way, gained 15 pounds this <laughs> summer for training camp. Will you cop to it right here, right now? Will you cop to the fact that you sought out some sort of Maple Leaf literature that had your weight at 208 to make sure that it was like updated? It, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it was 208 or 210, but I remember that year, like well into the season, you know how the stats pack would, would yeah. kind of, you know, the media pack would go to the team and the media every single game. I remember looking at it thinking, I think I weigh like 198 pounds right now. But on paper, <laughs> that was my weight at training camp, right? And I actually, um, in the summer, I was, I was skating at the, it was called the MasterCard Center at the time. I think it's called the Ford Performance Center, which was our, our practice facility. And I hadn't seen Babs all summer. And he walks in the room and he's kind of looking around and look, we make eye contact. He's like, uh, you look bigger. I said, yeah, I'm 210. And so that was, I just, you know, like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm 210 pounds. Like, so ho hopefully you like it, but I, he didn't like it. That's so, my middle name, yeah. 210. <laughs> um, the other interesting thing around the Canucks skating right now is the appearance of Tanner Pearson, who looks like he's ready to be a National Hockey League player, ready to be a professional Hockey League player. We'll see what league he's playing in to start the season at the very least. But um, imagine if you're Vasily Pod Colson right now and you see Tanner Pearson um, you know, at these skates. I don't know that he would have been on the menu for, for minutes competition for Vasily Pod Colson you know, a month and a half ago, but now all of a sudden Vasily's got to think, oh, shoot, there's another physical kind of forward, a winger that I'm going to be competing for minutes for uh, with. Yeah. You know, do you think it changes some of the uh, mindsets of, of some players to see him out there? If it, I don't know if it changes the mindset because for a guy like Pod Colson, like he was going to have to really earn it at training camp anyways. But mm -hmm. I, I think if anything, it's like there, it's a it's a little reality check of what the NHL is and can be for a young player trying to make their way. Like, you know, you, you count someone out because you think there's a medical issue and all of a sudden they're back. And by the way, Tanner Pearson is, you know, an experienced NHL player who's had a lot of success, scored a lot of goals. And uh, quite frankly, I, I think he's a guy that, you know, if he gets into good shape and, and, and Rick Tockett thinks he can help the team, I think he can help the team as well. And, you know, I think it was Jeff, you kind of talked about how in January where, you know, this team could have gone one way or the other and they chose to kind of keep relevant in the playoff race. If I'm the head coach and I see that this guy in Tanner Pearson, um, you know, come back into the mix, I'm really happy about that. I'm excited about that because now it adds another element of a player who's kind of been there, done that, understands what the NHL grind is like. And I would imagine, you know, Tanner Pearson is what, 31 years old? Like he's got game left. He's, he's not, you know, he's not done by any stretch of the imagination. And if anything, you know, the last year or so where, where Tanner Pearson has been out of the lineup has made him, you know, hungrier to, to get back in and, um, you know, never really come out again. So, um, listen, for, for the young wingers, there there's going to be opportunity. I know there's a lot of them, um, but it, it just seems like they're all kind of clumped in, in the same regard here. Tanner Pearson, for me, if he's feeling good and healthy and, and ready to go, he's like one step above that. Um, and, and if anything, it helps, you know, guys that are going to lead the way on this team, like your, your Pedersons and uh, your Quinn Hughes on the back end. But like, it's just going to help having more guys that have been there, done that and um, are very good players. Tanner Pearson, like everybody, was once a rookie. The NHL, NHLPA rookie showcase going on at the Capitals training facility uh, outside of Washington. No Canucks this year. Uh, but I, that can't really be a slight on the organization. I mean, it's cyclical. They've come through a run where Pedersen and Hughes and before that Besser uh, were all front and center and were all finalists. And in Pedersen's case, rookie of the year. Um, did you ever get that call, Frank? A, a young Frank Corrado? Did he this ever get is, the call to This is a sore spot for me. This, oh, is, a, oh. this is something I, I, I have held a grudge on, okay? <laughs> I, I, I got called up after junior. I played three regular season games. I played four playoff games. And then the following summer, they had this rookie card showcase thing, and I wasn't invited. 
And I asked my agent, I said, what's going on here? How does this, like, I have seven NHL games to my name. These guys, there's a lot of them there. You know, they might've been drafted before me, might've been drafted after me. Why are, why are some of these guys there? And the way he explained it to me was this. At the time, there were two rights holders. It was Panini and it was Upper Deck. And Panini wanted me there and Upper Deck apparently didn't. And I was so pissed about that because it's kind of cool. Like, I love sports cars as a kid. Like, I have, I probably still have all my hockey cards in a binder with the autographs and all that stuff. And I could never wrap my head around it. And then I started thinking, wait a second. Vancouver is a massive Canadian market with a massive fan base. I'm like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't they want me there? Like, how does the tie not go to me in that situation? Right, there's good business like, decisions exactly, to bring you there. Like, yes. even, at, even at 20 years old, I was like, wait a second, what's, what's the business behind this? Like, no offense to some of the American markets, okay? <laughs> like, Nashville is an unbelievable place to watch a game, all that kind of stuff. But I was like, why is there two guys from Nashville? Or like, why is there, like, the tie's got to go to the Canadian team. I, I never understood it. So, Jeff, I wish I could tell you what it's all about, being <laughs> at this thing, signing the cards. Like, P Panini America, at the time, they sent me a card deal. I did all the autographs. It was great. It wasn't until I got picked up by Toronto that finally Upper Deck gave me a little something to uh, sign hey, a couple surprise, cards. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but yeah. you see that? You see that, Blake? It's like, you got to go to Toronto. For, for us to notice you, I'm like, guys, you got to get out to Vancouver. It's an unbelievable city. The fan support is great. But anyways, that's, uh, that's still a sore spot for me. How many uh, Frank Corrado cards do you have in your possession right now? If we opened up the closet, went into the attic, wherever you got them, how many Frank Corrado cards do you own? Let's put it this way. There's more here between my house, my in-laws, and my parents' house than there is anywhere else in the world combined <laughs> so where i'm from you've hoarded yeah so where, where i'm from you know in in vaughan ontario apparently the story goes that there's more italians here than there is anywhere else combined now i don't know if that's true but that's the way the hockey cards are we have more hockey cards of me in our possession than anyone else does combined so um yeah i mean listen they're they're pretty cool um Pretty cool pieces of memorabilia. I never thought, you know, when I was a kid that I would have my own real hockey card with stats on the back and an NHL jersey. So it's uh, it, it was always, you know, one of those kind of pinch me moments to see the hockey cards. All the cards ending up there because of the Italian quotient. It, perhaps it should come as no surprise. And of the two card companies that wanted or uh, that were taking part, the one that wanted you was named Panini. Yeah, and actually, my dad made a really cool piece of memorabilia with a lot of my rookie cards. I'm going to, once we finish the interview, I'm going to send you a picture, and you guys can put it up if you want. I would love that. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to talk to you next week as well. Enjoy it. We're getting closer to hockey season. Frank is right around the corner. Thanks, guys. This great clip brought to you by, wait for it, great clips. It's going to be great.